vast continent of Australia is largely arid desert, desperately in need of water. Its great cities are all on the lush coastal fringe. Tasmania, the smallest and southernmost of the Australian states, is an island which has an abundance of water. It lies squarely in the path of the Roaring Forties, the prevailing westerly winds which circle the globe almost continuously in these latitudes. Moving across thousands of miles of ocean, unimpeded by any landmass, these rain-bearing winds cross Tasmania's rugged west coast, where steep mountain ranges and unbelievably dense rainforests form a catchment area. The mountains build up to a central plateau, which supports a number of high-level lakes. These lakes, together with abundant regular rainfall, enabled the state government to introduce hydroelectric power schemes to produce Australia's cheapest power. For more than half a century, the Hydroelectric Commission has developed the water resources of the island to produce power in such quantities that the head of population, Tasmania ranks second only to Norway. To achieve this, lake levels have been raised by the erection of great dams, rivers have been diverted, and new lakes have been formed. Now, in the heart of the southwest of the state, two new lakes will be created to become Australia's largest water storage, with an area of nearly 200 square miles. Lake Gordon will be created by the building of a concrete dam on the Gordon River, and Lake Pedder will be formed by the erection of two smaller dams. The existing Lake Pedder, set in the centre of this huge, almost flat valley, will disappear when the water level is raised by 50 feet. This small lake, nearly a thousand feet above sea level and surrounded by spectacular mountain ranges, has on its eastern shore a magnificent beach formed by thousands of years of wave action and westerly winds and said to contain anything from two to three million tons of pure pink quartz sand. The unique nature of the lake in its present form has stimulated the state government to produce this film to record its beauty before it disappears to make way for the greater Lake Pedder. Walking across this vast beach in the southwest of Tasmania, a thousand feet above sea level, surrounded by the incredible peaks of the Clankland Ranges. It's my first visit. It's an overwhelming experience. It's vast and primeval, beautiful, peaceful, dynamic, changeable. This is Lake Pedder. I know if I look back along the beach, I'll see three artists. Patricia Giles, Max Angus, Harry Bucky. Each focusing attention on a different aspect of the lake, the beach, the mountains. And through the media of watercolor, pastel drawing, they distill the essence of this changing grandeur. They've painted together for many years. They share a love of the Tasmanian landscape. For them, this is an important journey. They've been here many times before, but never for such a long period, and never with such a purpose. This 12-day visit carries with it a burning responsibility. Lake Pedder will never be the same again. Olegis Trahanis, photographer, bushwalker extraordinary and explorer, loves this area and has walked and explored extensively. He's the only man to have navigated successfully the Gordon and Serpentine rivers from a start in Lake Pedder. He did this in 1958. Olegis needs solitude and closer identification with the environment, away from the conviviality of the camp. So yesterday he took his tents and climbed to a six-foot ledge just below the highest peak in the Franklin Range. I can see it now. It's big enough to hold his tent and that's all. He'll be back tomorrow. Another of our party, cartographer Frank Bolt, has walked with heavy photographic equipment to the far northern corner of the lake this afternoon. The light is ideal to photograph the citadel from the rainforest. His black and white photographs dramatically and poetically interpret the landscape. The others of our party are swimming in the creek or climbing, but just to walk on this beach, surrounded by this vast amphitheater of mountains, is exhilarating. 
We made the journey by light aircraft into Lake Pedder on the Saturday of the Australia Day weekend, 1971. It took us half an hour from the Cambridge airport near Hobart. We brought all our gear and provisions, set up a camp, and we'll stay for 12 days. Each one of our party, apart from me, has walked in, or out, or both. There are two ways, through the plains of button grass at the foot of the Franklins and out to the Scotts Peak Road, but the more spectacular route is via the Coronet Mountains at the northeast of the lake, across the Sentinels and down to the Gordon River Road. From the Coronets, you have the most magnificent view of the lake. Harry Bucky, much-loved painter, whose vision of the landscape is truthful and sincere, remembers his first journey into Pedder in the summer of 1947-48. Well, Harry, was this the sort of weather you had when you first came to Pedder? How long ago was it? Oh, about 23 years ago, yes, the summer of 1947-48. And uh, we came in, of course, by plane. Was that the and first trip? First trip, yes, the first plane trip by any members of the walking club. And coming in by plane, of course, I hadn't seen any of the southwestern scenery before. And when the mountains came into view one after the other, it was simply astounding. The lake came into view quite suddenly because they usually made from Cambridge to Mount Anne, if the weather was clear. From Mount Anne, they'd turn west, and the lake comes into view just a little bit after. It was at Harry Bucky's instigation that people began to fly into Lake Pedder, and those who came regularly acknowledged this fact by naming this hill Bucky's Bonnet. To me, it is a place of great beauty and charm, beautiful in all its aspects of storm and sunny calm, with a beach that must be unique in all Australia. It is a pink quartz sand, as fine as that of any ocean beach. One also has the feeling, no matter what one's age may be, of a sense of adventure. The mountains throw out a challenge to climb and explore. I'm very glad that I have done a small amount of that climbing and exploring. There were several plane loads of visitors and campers together with walkers that weekend. Some stayed an hour, some for several days. There were freshwater biologists, naturalists, bushwalkers, and just plain pedder lovers who'd come, as we had, for individual reasons, to experience this majestic and serene environment. As Max Angus said, it was like a summer festival to Pedder. But this is one of the last times that the beach will be accessible to aircraft. During 1972, the Hydroelectric Commission will have begun to flood the present lake and the floor of the Great Valley which holds it. This whole area will be submerged by a depth of 50 feet of water to form the new Lake Pedder. Mount Solitary will be an island, the olive gold button grass will be covered, and this unique beach will be a memory. It's to perpetuate this memory that this particular group of friends is assembled for 12 days. Filmmaker Ray Barnes has made several journeys into Lake Pedder. Pedder is the end product of glacial activity over the past 15,000 years. The mountain valleys have been carved out by ice and the abraded sand material forms the valley floor. This two mile square lake with its ever changing moods presents a unique challenge to a filmmaker. Surveyor Wedge discovered Lake Pedder in 1835, naming the range of mountains after the Surveyor General Franklin and the lake after the first Chief Justice of Tasmania, Sir John Lowe's Pedder. Olegas Trahanis has a more intriguing story. Surveyor Wedge might not have been the first man to see the lake because sometime in the late 30s a bushwalking party found on the northern small beach of Pedder a legard which must have come from the settlement island Penno colony. Olegas tells of the naming of the nearby mountains Anne and Solitary. The Solitary, according to the story, was a young convict of Italian descent, a solitaire, transported to Hobart on a convict ship. Anne was the captain's daughter, and the two fell in love. When the ship arrived in Hobart, solitaire managed to escape, meet Anne in secret, and both escaped in a hope of making life together in the southwestern wilderness. 
Apparently they climbed the mountain that overlooks the beach of Peder. But on the way down, Hain slipped and the solitaire trying to save her also stumbled and fell. And they both died on the eastern face of Mount Solitary, which faces Mount Ian. There is, beyond all doubt, a feature which resembles a human face looking towards Mount Ian. It takes time to absorb this place. It takes time to get used to the apparent silence, which gradually becomes delicate sound. The light, changeable breeze rippling the water, the distant frogs in the evenings, the solo bird calls replacing the expected dawn chorus, the distortion of distant voices because the amphitheater of mountains forms a whispering gallery. It takes time to realize that in the surrounding land there's an abundance of animals, but they're mainly nocturnal in habits. In the lake, there are millions of microscopic crustaceans and plants in the plankton. Large numbers of aquatic oligochaetes, relatives of the earthworm, live in the moist quartz sand. In the nearby swamps, a primitive shrimp-like crustacean was recently described for the first time and named Alanaspides helenomus. Some of these species, endemic to the present lake pedda, may disappear for all time. The slope is so gradual on the floor of the lake that the maximum depth is only about 10 feet. The water changes colour from a tawny port to a cobalt tea. The colour is the result of humic acids washed out of the button grass plains and carried to the lake through the Mariah Creek. This water is fresh and exhilarating. All this takes time to absorb, but you just cannot take for granted this changing beauty. You see, when I first came to this country, I was trying to best I could to acquaint myself with it, with the landscape, with the land. And I soon found out that the most interesting, the most unspoiled and untouched part of Tasmania is to be found in the southwest. The Lake Pedder used to be for us a place where we started many journeys into the mountains, down the rivers, the canoe journeys down the Serpentine and the Gordon, down the Huon, down the Franklin and Davy River, all started at Lake Pedder. At Lake Pedder is a place where we can set up our supplies, depots, where we can dry out our gear when we come down from the mountains. And when we come back to Pedder from some distant journey, although it's still three days to go to Maidena, the trip used to be virtually at an end. The unique feature of the present Lake Pedda is the wide beach. No other freshwater lake in Australia has such an extensive beach of quartzite sand. For well-known artist Max Angus, whose fine watercolours evocatively express the changing moods of the Tasmanian landscape, for Max Angus, this beach is the focal point of Lake Pedda. It's quite impossible to describe Lake Pedda to, to anybody. Uh, I've talked to people about the size of it. It's uh, two miles long, and in the summer when the lake drops, it's seven or eight minutes walk to the water's edge from the back of the beach. Well, you can think about this, but the reality of Pedder is being on the beach and seeing for yourself because it's, it's just so vast. The other thing, of course, about Pedder, from the painter's point of view, is the wonderful variety of mood, particularly for watercolour painting, where <clears throat> anything can happen at any time of the day. Then, of course, there's the everlasting quality of the water itself, this, this beautiful lake, which when you look from the beach right round the perimeter, it's only about eight or nine miles round, uh, you see these other little pockets of beach at odd points around the edge. At the moment, there's a spotless blue sky magnificent clarity of the water, the mountains, the, 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 the terrific amount of light being given off this pink sand. And yet we know, because Tasmania's in the path of the Roaring Forties, that at any moment the clouds could come across, the whole landscape change, the mountains take on that magnificent deep blue with silver and black clouds scurrying overhead, great curtains of silver rain sweeping across. It's a watercolorist delight if he can catch it without being caught himself. 
Around the perimeter of the lake you find many things of interest. There are quartzite stones which vary in shape and size and are encircled by a dark brown band which consists of iron and manganese. They're called pedda pennies. Minute colorful flowers grow amongst the smooth stones. Some plants, belonging to the genera Centralipus and Milligania, are not known in any other region. On the northern shore is rainforest, on either side of which are indented beaches, which vary in color and texture depending on the tones of the quartz. There's a small island near the western shores of the lake, not far from where the Erie Serpentine River has its source. Frank Bolt's imaginative response to Lake Pedder is seen in his fine black and white pictures. Eons of time have shaped this environment into one of rich forms, size and dimensions. Here, time and matter come and go in a majestic order. And as a mere human being, I feel that I am just a very minor part of it. In order to record onto the photographic plate some aspects of this ceaseless passing of time in this magnificent wilderness area, I have observed and studied Lake Pedder in many of its moods and manifestations. I choose the medium of black and white photography because through my eyes the essence of an environment is its shapes and moods, things in which color can only act as an extension of these basic shapes, dimensions and moods. In recreating and reproducing the scenes and impressions around me in black and white, the viewer of the final photographic enlargement is directly introduced to the very essence of the landscape. It's strange how the primitive shapes in the trees and rocks have almost a human identity. This group of trees at the southeast corner of the main beach specially appeals to Frank Bolt. Their shapes and forms remind him of people sadly struggling only to find a hard and bare existence in front of them. The painters also are fascinated by this group of trees. Patricia Giles, whose strong lyrical approach to painting has made her well known beyond her home state, tells of her response to Lake Pedder. It's a highly emotional one, I guess, in my work. I think it's a very beautiful place. It's an artist's paradise. We always have changing moods here, and I'm interested in mood painting, I think, more than anything. This morning I'm doing a pastel. It's so very bright, the light is a little hard, very glary, beautiful glary sand. And it's, uh, for me, more suited for pastel at the moment. I'll use watercolour early in the morning or later in the evening when we hope it'll be quieter and more clouds, more interesting effects. This is one of the beauties of the place. The, Button grass water with its deep tea colour causes a wonderful reflection. And if you're painting well and you can capture it, it's very satisfying. There's not a very great deal I can say because my expression of this is in paint. The Pedder experience is unique. Its beauty, peace, energy and exhilaration as individual. Each of us takes away the intangibles, memories, responses, and a tranquility to draw on for a long time. But the artists, painters Max Angus, Patricia Giles, and Harry Bucky, photographers Frank Bolt, Olegas Trujanus, Ray Barnes, transform their responses to convey to those who will never know that for them, this was Lake Pedder.